master of the wind. When contrary winds are blowing, it's good to know the master of the wind. Man, God bless you, friends. While we're standing, if you could take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to keep kind of on the same theme we've been on. I can't seem to get away from it, so we're just going to stick with it. And I keep bouncing in my, in my mind and in my understanding between Solomon's kingdom that he set up in the golden age of, of Israel and the new Jerusalem. And, and I just keep bouncing back and forth. And so we may talk about the new Jerusalem today and maybe Sunday we'll be back in, in uh, the Solomon's golden age. But praise be to God, I just see so many similarities to where we are now. I see so many parallels to what's going on with us now and I just like to explore that. In Psalm chapter one, verse one, let's read. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And let's just bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you've made a way for us to be here together, 
that we can worship with our brothers and sisters, that we can lift our voices in song and in praise, Lord, to glorify and magnify your greatness. Lord, as we come now, Lord, to this portion of service where we look to you to break the bread of life, we pray, God, that you would feed us. You're the great shepherd. May you feed us from your hand, Lord. May we not see a man, but may the man fade out of the picture, Lord, and may we see you coming down through a vessel of clay and ministering your word to your children. And may we take that word and grow by it, Lord, and become all that you want us to be in this day. May the word bring on flesh, and may that flesh bring, bring a manifestation in our lives that all may see. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Amen. As you're seated, I just want to share a testimony with you. I got uh, two letters in the mail today, and I just got them this afternoon. And uh, many of you remember Levi Yoder, the Amish man that um, Ezra had met and witnessed to and who had received the message, and he's over in uh, uh, Holmes County. Um, and then Annie, uh, his stepdaughter, who we've been corresponding with, and many of you know the saga that's been unfolding over the last year or two, actually more than that, more than two years with that. And I've got a letter from each of them today, and I want to read that to you. Annie's going to share a testimony. Uh, because of the situation, she wasn't permitted to live with her parents. Levi's her stepfather, and then his wife is her mother, and they wouldn't allow her. She's 24 years old, but they wouldn't allow her to go home. And she asked us to pray about that. She'd been praying about it, and last time Angie and I were there, we prayed with her about that. So she writes this in as a testimony. She said, hey, brothers and sisters, you have prayed me out of the prison of separation. On Friday, August 21st, 2020, at 1 p.m., this barrier was removed by the power of God. Dad met his probation officer on Friday. He told Dad, I am allowed to be here. Praise the Lord. The Lord has heard each and every one of your prayers. What man tries to make impossible, the Lord will make possible. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. She goes on to say, thank you to every one of you for praying for me. May God bless you. I have always believed that I will be here before my parents move into the new house. I told mom like that, and then she asked, you think so? I answered, yes, I will be here. If you believe and do not doubt in your heart, then it will come to pass. Praise the Lord. Chad Angie, next time you come, you will meet us together in our new house, probably in September. I can't wait to meet you once again. Mom and dad are in the main part of the new house and I am upstairs in my room in the new house today. I am blessed to be with my parents after being separated for 11 months, three weeks. The good, good Lord had a wonderful plan for me. Praise the Lord. Amen. God has turned her mourning into gladness. Then also in the, in the same envelope, I had a letter from uh, Brother Levi. This is a tremendous testimony as well. But he starts off by, in this portion I'm going to read, he starts off by saying, Annie is upstairs singing songs and thus cheering the atmosphere. <laughs> Such a great blessing. We are listening to the messages most every day and sometimes twice a day. Remember, we snuck in a little uh, tablet and uh, we slipped it in and we, we slipped in a backup battery pack and a bottom of a can of popcorn so he wouldn't get caught. And so this has been a lot of fun smuggling <laughs> message material into the Amish community. Praise be to God. Anyways, he says, thus cheering the atmosphere is such a great blessing. We are listening to the messages mo most every day and sometimes twice a day. These messages are of great encouragement to us in this time of preparation. The battle is on. Chad, you have stood by me so humbly encouraging me to stay with the church. Stay with the church and flesh so that the spirit can witness through me. I deeply appreciate you for that. Lately things surfaced to the point where I was invited to attend a ministerial meeting so that, so that all the bishops of our churches could hear my complaint. These are from three communities in Ohio and two in New York. In their mind, this was to humble me so I would quit talking about God's word and just do and believe what they say. Well, guess what? Christ won the victory. <laughs> Said Satan used my own parents to try to shut me up, but all to no avail. 
in front of approximately 10 or 12 bishops and preachers, I pled my cause by God's word. One preacher tried to push the cause by bringing up some things I had said concerning my faith in baptism, the Bible way, and laying on of hands, praying for the sick. I was prompted by God to quote the scripture for this and telling them that I've seen the sick get healed and have experienced it on my own body numerous times. God was just using this rare opportunity to witness to the blind, spiritually blind. After I stepped outside, they counseled over the matter for several hours. In the end, they adjusted some of their views on the subject we had come together for, and they never again mentioned my faith concerning baptism and healing. Praise be to God. I have nothing but God's word, and I need nothing else. Praise God. Praise God, all ye brethren. Praise to God. That, that is a wonderful, wonderful testimony. Our brother has been, his eyes have been opened. He's been enlightened to the message. And now when he was in the face of trouble, he stood upon the word. And they could not fight the word. Praise God. So I appreciate your prayers for Levi. No doubt that things are coming to a head. I doubt that he'll be able to stay, you know, in that church forever for maybe not even very much longer. But praise be to God, there must be somebody there that's got to hear something. Because he's been in there longer than I expected, and they keep, bringing, they keep bringing it around to conversations and discussions. But guess what? He, he, God keeps him there. And he keeps giving them the word, and then they have nothing to say. And I praise God. It's wonderful when the word of God shuts up those who are making accusations. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to fight. You don't have to argue. All you have to do is quote the scriptures. Praise be to God. Amen. We're still believing for his wife's healing. She's still in a wheelchair, and I just trust in God to raise her up for his glory, for a manifestation that will further open the eyes of many that are blind and cause them to love the word as Levi loves the word. So pray for us. We're going to try to head over there. We weren't able to, to visit. They've had the crews, some Amish crews working there for several months since I believe it was uh, May or June working on the house. But he says all is getting finished now in the next week, and he's inviting us to come out. So pray for us as we go out. And uh, Levi, with his new home, where he's situated is far away from everybody in his church who used to watch him. They used to spy on him, amen, and he's in a better situation, and he wants to open his house and start having Bible studies, inviting his friends and his family to start having Bible studies. So pray for us that God will make a way, and whatever God wants done will happen. But we certainly are encouraged by that, and we want to be there, amen. And if, if there's one more soul to come out, we want to be there. If not, we just want to testify the truth anyhow for all to hear so that everybody has a chance, amen. So be praying for that. Amen. So we, we read here in the book of Psalm, which we've read this, I think, a couple weeks ago, or a couple services ago, that this man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Brother Bram takes this scripture in one place, and he makes this his. He says, uh, this man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What man? The one who delights in the law of the Lord, the one who meditates on the law day and night. He says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit. And Brother Branham injects God's fruit. Not the man's fruit, but this man who's planted by the rivers of water shall bring forth God's fruit in, in the season. His leaf also shall not wither, and, whosoever, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper him. Let's turn over to Proverbs 11 and read one scripture over there. Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. That's a big statement. Because we know what the tree of life is. The tree of life is Christ. The tree of life brings eternal life. The tree of life is Christ. But here they're saying the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. This man who meditates on the law day and night, he'll be like a tree planted by the river's water that'll bring forth his fruit, God's fruit in due season, and his leaf shall not wither. And now the fruit of the righteous 
is a tree of life. And as, as we speak, I want to talk about uh, the dwelling places in the New Jerusalem. And there's a quote that Brother Brandon mentions here in a minute that I really want to hone in on and I want to talk about. But I, I want to look at this tree of life because as we begin to look through the scriptures, we find out that, that you know, we know the book of Genesis and the book of Revelations are book of symbols. We have trees in Genesis, we have, we have tree of life in the book of Revelations, and these symbolize something, and God is trying to tell us something through the symbols, because remember, he's hidden the truth in the book, amen? This is a great mystery that's been through this whole Bible, and the whole mystery's been spelled out through the Bible, but it's been spelled out in mystery form so that at the end of time, he could come through a prophetic gift, and he could begin to reveal to us the mysteries that are laying in the book, amen? And part of the way he does that is by interpreting the symbols to us. So... We, we praise God that now we see the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And, and you have to ask yourself, how many trees of life are there? <laughs> Amen. How many trees of life are there? And I would, ju- I would say it this way. There is a tree of life. But that tree of life, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to even try to guess how many representations there are of that tree of life. But there is one tree of life, just like there is one Christ. But we know Christ's body is many, many. One Christ, but his body is many. Praise God. And so, how many are trees of life? Well, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Amen. Amen. So, praise God. I don't think the Bible's referring to another tree of life, or that there's an alternate tree of life, or that you can either have Christ the tree of life, or the fruit of righteousness, or the, the, the fruit of the righteous can be another tree of life, so that now you have two paths to eternal life, but it's the same thing in another manifestation. It's the same thing in another form. It's the same thing in another expression. Let's go to Revelation 21. That's why, you know, I'm so thankful that God sent a messenger in this day Because I grew up in church from the time I was probably two or three weeks old through my entire life. I probably never missed more than two weeks worth of services in my whole life. I was faithful to go to church and taught in Sunday school and and all the things that you normally have in church. Amen. But, But I learned the Bible as symbols. I learned the Old Testament as stories. But God came and he took all those pieces that were laying there and they were disjointed and they were separated and they were, they were puzzle pieces, but I didn't know they were puzzle pieces and they were laying all over the table. But God brought a prophet in our day to show you the picture and start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. These aren't stories. There's one story. These aren't Old Testament stories. Amen. These aren't New Testament. This isn't New Testament history. This is one story, one goal, one purpose God had. And the whole Bible is explaining one mystery, one mystery purpose that he had, one thing God wanted to achieve in the whole Bible. I so enjoyed Sunday service with Brother Aaron here. You know, I sat in my seat and just fed and fed and fed. Amen. Because it's exactly, it's exactly the truth. Amen. It's not, it's not this, you know, Genesis account here, and Revelation's account here. The Genesis and Revelation account go right here. What seed was sown there comes to fruition over here. What started there comes to full manifestation at the end of the book. So we don't separate these things out, and, and we understand that God speaks to us many times in symbols and in metaphors and, and giving examples that, that point to a, a greater truth. And so I grew up all my life thinking that someday, if I'm good and God is good to me, that I'll be able to walk up to a literal tree and pluck a piece of fruit off of that literal tree and eat that fruit and somehow have eternal life. But then through the message, I realized I can eat of that tree now. I don't have to wait. That tree is here. That tree is available. There's fruit on that tree. Amen. We can come to the tree of life and eat of the tree of life and and have eternal life. I don't have to wait to go find a tree and, and for the, the tree to be restored in a physical way, amen, and, 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 and hope that someday I can get there and someday I can eat it, amen. I'm here, amen, in the presence of the tree and can eat of that tree. It's like the New Jerusalem. Oh, I want to go to that city. Friends, I'm in that city. 
I'm looking at that city. Amen. There's a reflection of that city on the earth. Amen. And if you see the reflection, you better understand the city. It's an easier way to understand the city by understanding the reflection. So, so, so many things that we put off in the future or kick down the road. Amen. I, I, I don't want anybody to ever misunderstand what I'm saying when I say that because it's so easy to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that I don't want a physical manifestation. I want to live in that city at the end of the millennium. I want, amen, I want in the millennial reign to see Christ sit on the throne of David in a physical form that I can see in my physical form. I long for that. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. But I'm not going to just sit on my heels. Amen. And, and long for the day that someday I see that. I'm seeing the representation of it now. I'm experiencing the reality of it now. Amen. All that is is a further unfolding of what he's doing now. What he's doing now will further unfold in the millennium. What he does in the millennium will further unfold, amen, in, in, uh, in eternity after the millennium. It's just a further expression, a further unfolding of the same thing we have here today. So how, amen, how, uh, 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 how wonderful it is that God has been so good to us, amen, to take away Sunday school stories and give us reality, to take away the carrot at the end of the stick, amen, and all Christianity is following the carrot at the end of the stick. If I'm good and do good, someday I'll get to eat that carrot. And all Christians led around, amen, hoping to eat the carrot someday. Friends, amen, forget it. I'm eating from the tree of life, amen. The food is here, amen. The life is here. Christ is here. Amen. Praise be to God. So don't take these things and shelf them over here or put them back there. Bring everything today, amen. Today is the day. If we experience it today, amen, it's a guarantee you'll experience it that day. If you miss it today, you'll miss it that day. Revelation 21, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her, was light, her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Man, I, was, I enjoyed Aaron reading that on Sunday because it was already in my notes for tonight. <laughs> Amen. But, but now... This, this angel is going to show John the lamb's wife. So when John turns to see the lamb's wife, he sees a city. Then let's go uh, further to 22. In one, within that city, he begins to show him things that are in the city, Revelation 22 and one, and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So when we look at this scripture now, uh, we've been through this several times, but in this city, when he, when he goes to see the Lamb, he sees the city. When he when he, when he wants to, when he, want, when he goes to see the bride of the lamb, when he goes to see the lamb's wife, amen, he shows him the new Jerusalem. So the new Jerusalem is an expression of the lamb's wife. And the lamb's wife is an expression of the new Jerusalem. So the two go together. Why do the two go together? Because scripture put them together. If you want to see the new Jerusalem, look at the lamb's wife. If you want to see the Lamb's wife, look at the New Jerusalem. Amen. They're the expression of the same thing. Praise God. So now, now with that in mind, let's, let's keep looking at this subject. Brother Bram says, in the future home, the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride, he said, oh, holy mountain, there will be streets of transparent gold, avenues and houses and parks. If you want to read this, Revelation 21, 18, the tree of life will be there. Twelve different manners of fruit, one each month, will be bore on it. The people that eat these fruits, they'll change their diet every month. Now, 
if you look in the scripture, and when it talks about this in verse two, it said in the midst of the street on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. So this tree is referred to in the feminine, but we know that the tree of life is Christ. But here it's referred to in the feminine, amen, because Christ also has a feminine side. Christ is known in masculine and feminine. Amen. So Brother Ram says all the way back in 1957, in questions and answers on Hebrews, he says, there's even a tree in there and the tree on either side bears 12 manner of fruit and they yield their fruit once a month, which is 12 months in the year. They, re they, they render 12 manner of fruit every year as it goes by. 12 is that worship number, you see. So he says there's 12 manner of fruit, there's 12 months in the year, and 12 is a worship number, amen? And we realize that the term worship, amen, is not the same term as praise. Praise means to shout forth or declare, or it comes from a root word that means to shoot an arrow, amen, to sing something out or say something out or to sing praises to the Lord. But worship means to bow down. So worship is the act of submission or reverence to, to deity or to a king, amen, is this term worship. So worship has a manifestation to it, or worship has fruit. What is the fruit of worship? The fruit of worship is obedience to the word. A fruit of worship, amen. For instance, Cain and Abel both brought worship. And both of their worship brought fruit, but one fruit was rejected and the other fruit of worship was received because one came by revelation of the word and one came by self-will, amen. But, but both of these worshipers were bringing forth worship and their worship was manifest in what they did. And the manifestation was the fruit of their worship, and one was rejected because it was the wrong kind of fruit, and one was received because it was the right kind of fruit. So here we find that, that these 12 men are a fruit, amen, they represent, they represent worship or true worship or perfect worship, amen, which is not ever expressed in self-will. It's always expressed in a total submission to God, and God is his word. So there will be a tree that bears fruit all the time. And it's wonderful to note it's not just one manner of fruit, but there's a continual fruit. If we could say it this way, and this is just me, this is just Brother Chad, but th th there's a perpetual bearing of the fruit, a consistent, constant, in season bearing fruit. There's never a month, there's never a change of the calendar, there's never a period of time that there's not fruit on this tree. Which means that, that this, 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 this tree, this tree of life that's here, amen, is a constantly bearing a fruit. Amen, it's not all the same, amen. It's fruit at church and it's fruit at home and it's fruit at work and it's fruit when you're alone and it's fruit for every season and manner of life. It's not one-sided, it's not hypocritical. It doesn't have gaps in it. Amen. So many times, you know, even in our Christian walk through time, if we look, if we look through our history, we can find gaps in our bearing of fruit. I was good at church and I was good at home, amen, but I began to struggle at school. I was good here, good here, I struggled here, amen. But, but this is a tree that is going to bear every month, amen. Consistently bearing fruit, nonstop, every month, consistently. It doesn't go through a dry time. It doesn't go through an empty spell. It doesn't go through any time of barrenness, but she's going to bring forth the fruit of the word constantly, amen, in a perfect worship back to God again and again and again and again. And she's going to do it in honesty and integrity, and, and every manner of operation is going to be fruit. Every obstacle, every trial is going to be fruit. This is a tree of life, amen, that's going to be bearing the fruit of life. This is the quote that I want to hone in on and pay close attention to here for the next little bit. And this is what triggered a lot of my thinking. In the future home, he says, on this throne on top of it, 1,500 miles high, the whole world will see the light of the world, Jesus, sitting on the throne on top of the world, top of the church, top of Mount Zion, which is 1,500 miles, half the size of the United States, and raises plumb up till you can see him the world over 1,500 miles high. 
Now, Mother Branham is talking in, in very real measurements, amen, in very real uh, 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 measurements and, 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 and space and things like that. But let's bring this right back home now to where we are now. Because when Brother Branham preached future home, you know well, because I told you, Brother Branham draws an analogy in future home, and he's showing the future the, you know, 1,500 miles square at the base and going up 1,500 miles, there's going to be a physical mountain rise up out of the earth and a city dwell over it. But he says, I could drop a little something here. He says, that's about the dimensions we got right here now. He's talking about in the church, one from Maine down to Arkansas, one from here in Canada over to the coast. He said, it's about what we have here, showing that that city that's there is represented on earth. So if that's so, on top of Mount Zion, amen, where is the light of the Lamb shining to the whole world today? Where is it today, friend? Don't tell me where it's going to be, amen, a thousand years from now or more. But where is that light shining now? That light is on top of the mountain, amen. It's on top of Mount Zion. And where is the top of Mount Zion? It's the bride age, friends. On top of the seven church ages, the capstone has come down. He himself has united with his bride, and it's the lamb enthroned in her. And that's the light of the whole world. There is no other light for this world. Amen. It is light. It's the top of the city. It's the top of Mount Zion. It's the top of the church ages. It is him and her united as one. And now he is reflecting himself down through her, through the whole city, because it's all the truth. It's all the character. It's everything that's been built up through the entire New Testament church. Now on full display. Where is the light of the world? On top of Mount Zion. Who is the light of the world? The Lamb, Jesus Christ himself. Is he on his throne? Yes. Is his light shining? Yes. Is the light shining in darkness? Every much as so as was shining the day that light came to the earth and they were so stuck in darkness they refused to receive the light. Not a physical light, not a light you can see, not a light that's widely accepted or recognized as light. Because when Jesus was here, he was not widely accepted and not recognized as light, but he said, I am the light of the world. And I am the life. I am the light and I am the life. And I want to say, friends, on top of Mount Zion, he's here. The light is here, the life is here. Outside of that, light is darkness. The city is reflected here on earth. The light is here. So now we, we got in our minds in the right spot. Brother Brandon's preaching future home. I, I'd like to say just as, in my own way of thinking, my own understanding, amen. Brother Brandon's preaching future home not to get us excited about something that will come someday. But Brother Brandon's preaching future home to get you to recognize what is today. What is here, amen, and what is here is showing what will be. And what will be is known by what is. So I'm in the same quote in future home. And all up and down here will be the redeemed. There will be the houses of pure gold. Listen, I don't care about a house of gold. You understand, gold represents deity. Deity tabernacled in flesh, and one day this flesh is gonna be changed into body like his own glorious body, and it will be pure gold. Amen, when we get a glorified body, that will be your house of pure gold. Right now, the Holy Ghost is sanctifying, cleaning this house so that he can live in it, but this is not yet the house of pure gold, but I've got a house of pure gold coming, amen, and it's not one that's got a couch and a sofa and something I'm going to sit in, amen, it's a body, it's a body where my atoms have changed and made like into his own glorious body. Houses of pure gold, there will be avenues and parks and gardens. And the river of life come trickling out of the throne and running down through little chasms and oh, over every terrace. And listen to this. And the tree of life will be blooming in every yard. Amen. 
You know what? I don't think Brother Branham's misquoting the Bible or trying to add to the Bible. I think he's trying to get us to understand a picture. He's painting a picture. You say, where do you get that in the Bible? I didn't see that in the Bible every yard. Amen. He's a prophet of God. He's trying to get you to see something. He said the, 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 there'll be parks and gardens. What is this? This is a recreation of the Garden of Eden. The city is the garden. The garden's in the city. Amen. He's in the garden. Amen. Like Aaron was sharing with us on Sunday. Amen. God, amen, the first work he did was make a garden. Amen. Eastward in Eden mean the beginning or at the start of Eden he made a garden and he put the man in the garden. And here once again he's got a city that's a garden and the man is in the garden. And the river of life flowing down, it's a well-watered land. From the throne, it's watering down, trickling down through every terrace and every chasm. That means every part of this bride is well watered. And the tree of life will be blooming in every yard. And bear its fruits 12 times a year, a changing fruit every month. So I want to focus on this. The tree of life will be blooming in every yard. Amen. That means, amen, in my house, in front of my house, there should be a tree of life blooming. That means if that image is supposed to be reflected here, that means in my yard, there should be a tree of life blooming now, friends. There should be something, amen, declaring the very life of the tree of life is present on the earth now because in my yard, if I'm going to have a yard there with a tree of life blooming, then I've got to have a place here with the tree of life blooming in my yard. Praise be to God. Listen, this is not the day for partial. That was church ages. Dip in the Holy Ghost, partial outpouring, partial understanding, partial, 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 add, add, add. Amen. It's all been added. Amen. It's all been poured back in. It's all been given back. So this is not the time of partial. This is the time of full manifestation. So the tree of life will be blooming in every yard. When I read that, I said, oh, God, let the tree of life bloom in my yard. Let it be blooming now in my yard, Lord. He says in the restoration of the bride tree from 1962, the first thing that he did is he destroyed God's first precious fruit tree, Christ. He was the tree from the Garden of Eden. That's right. The first, the first fruit tree, he destroyed it. First one God planted here on earth was Christ. He destroyed that tree that was bearing his fruit. Now they had all kinds of organizations, and he just had that in his hands, but when he come to that tree that bore the actual fruit, that Roman bug got in there, see, destroyed the tree. The tree, yes, Jesus said uh, in St. John, if I do not the works of my Father, or have not the fruits of my Father, don't believe me, he was bearing the fruit of God. He was the tree from the garden. He was the tree of life, amen, and Rome cut him down and hung him on a tree. And he says he destroyed that. He, he's the tree that was destroyed all the way back from the, from, he was the tree from the Garden of Eden that had been destroyed. And if you look in Genesis 3, 14, I'll just read it to you. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So all the way back after the fall, God planted a seed of his word showing that there would be a seed of a woman that would come forth. And it was planted all the way back from the Garden of Eden. And all through the Old Testament, that seed of the tree of life grew, grew through the prophets, grew through the Psalms and prophets, grew all the way up until it come into full fruit bearing. And what did they do to that tree? They cut it down and hung it on a cross. And out from that tree came another tree, and that was a bride tree. Amen. But the Roman bug got into that tree in the first age and began to eat the fruit and then eat the leaves. Amen. Eat the bark and then suck the sap. 
But he said, I will restore, saith the Lord, all that the canker worm, palmer worm, caterpillar, locust have eaten. I will restore, saith the Lord, because there was a seed planted in Genesis from Eden that grew up. Amen. Then the Romans destroyed that. And then he brought forth a bride tree and the Roman bug destroyed that. But he's going to have one in the last day that's a restored bride tree that will not be destroyed by Rome. Amen. Because Rome, the veil has been taken away and Rome cannot deceive her anymore. No more deception like in the garden. No more deception like in the first age because he's, re- he's opened the book. He's loosed the seal. The mystery of God's mind is revealed like never before on this earth. And why did he reveal the seal? Why did he break the seal and unlock the mystery? Amen. So that this bride won't be deceived. She's predestinated not to be deceived. So he sent a word. Amen. Because she was deceived by words. He brought a word that'll stop deception. Remember in the beginning, the woman was deceived by words. In the first church age, she was deceived by words. Doctrines and teachings. So he came and he gave us his whole mind so that we can't be deceived any longer by words because he gave us his word. That's why if we just stick with the word, we won't be deceived. Not try to manipulate it into it, just stick with it. And as God reveals it and opens it and you see it and it's there and it's plain, just stay with the word. See, he said in the end time evangelism from 1962, he said, look here, remember my message recently on the bride tree, how they took Jesus, he was the tree, the one that David saw, a tree planted by the rivers of water, his fruit and season, the most perfect tree, and they cut him down and hung him on a man-made Roman tree for a mockery. But what did he do? Rose up again on the third day. What else did he do? He set forth a bride tree, a man and a woman like the trees that was in the Garden of Eden, two trees. One of them the tree of life, one of them the tree of death, and what did he do? He come to redeem this tree. So since he redeemed it at Calvary, he's ready to plant her now. Oh my, I get the feeling religious when you say that, see, to restore his bride tree, the one that should have been in Eden, but she fell there because she disbelieved the word. But here he's going to restore a tree that will believe the word. And when she come up on the day of Pentecost, that original doctrine, that original faith, then what did the Rome begin to do? Send a canker worm, send a palmer worm, and each one took his part of the, of the fruit the leaves and everything and sucked it all down. But what did the prophet saw that he said, but I will restore that tree, saith the Lord. She started back in the Reformation. What did she do? Organized. God pruned her. Right in St. John 14, cut all the organization off of it. And she came back to Wesley. She organized, pruned her off. But I will restore. She's still coming. Now what does it do? In the evening time, there there will be not an organization. There will be a top. Where does the fruit ripen at first? In the top. Why? The sun hits it. In the evening time, the seeds are planted now for the evening time bride tree. When the tree of life returns back to the bride tree. What was the restoration doing in the Reformation? It was bringing back the sap. It was bringing back the bark. It was bringing back the leaves. Bringing back blooms. But in order to bring back fruit, you've got to bring back the bridegroom tree. And what will it be in the end time? He said in the end time, what will it be? He said when the tree of life returns back to the bride tree. You see, and the evening lights has come out now to water and ripen that fruit that's been on the tree that's been planted. Oh, praise God. This is the day we live in, friends. This is the place where we're at. I I say it like this. Today, in this world, there is a light. There is a light on the throne on top of Mount Zion in the bride. It's the light of the Lamb. It's God is the light thereof, and the Lamb is the light thereof. But I also want to say that there's a tree of life in every yard. Bearing the same fruit he bore, amen, a full manifestation of the full life, amen, it's to be here in this day, and it's to be in every yard. That's why when we do the carrot on the stick thing, 
You know, it's so detrimental to our Christian walk to keep putting things off. Because, you know, everything is hanging at the end of the stick. We'll call it the golden carrot. When I eat that, I'll have arrived. When I eat that, I'll manifest the life. When I eat that, I'll be perfect. When I get there. But he's given us the fruit of the tree. He's given us all the food we need to overcome in this day. He's given us all the food with all the vitamins, with all the nutrients, with all the substance that we need to be everything he's called for his bride to be in this day. We've got to eat on it and become what we eat. We've got to feed on the word, amen, not kick it down, not sometime in our mind, amen, project in the future, I'll do better. In the future, I'll overcome. In the future, today's the day to overcome. Today's the day to let the tree bloom in your yard. God wants it to bloom. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a process. We're all in the process. There's a process to this. God's working us in the process. Amen. But we're all going to be blooming. The tree of life will be blooming in every yard. In the the message, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Prophet of God says, now remember, he is that tree of life contrary to the serpent seed, you see. He is that seed, the woman's seed, the tree of life in the garden. Unless they put forth their hands and move this tree, they'd eat that tree and live forever. And he's the only tree that can be taken that you can live forever. His word is life. And that by the word then, the word of God, which Eve turned down in the garden of Eden, then here is Christ, the word made manifest. And when he come on earth, he was the tree of life. Do you believe that? And Rome, what did they do? He had to be chopped down and he was put on a tree of disgrace. Cursed is he that hang on a tree. Became a curse for the human race. And now through that, through what? Through Calvary. And now through that, he brings forth a bride tree, which will be the tree of life restored back to him as husband and wife in the Garden of Eden. Glory to God by the same word and the same God made manifest in husband and wife. The same bride tree back again. So now, at the end time, amen, the bridegroom tree will come back to the bride tree. The tree of life will come back to the bride tree, amen. And at the same time, amen, the bride tree will be stored back to the tree of life. The two are coming back together again. By the same word and the same God made manifest in husband and in wife. The same word and same God made manifest in the husband is the same word and same God to be made manifest in the wife. Let's turn together to Isaiah 61. Now, you may remember Isaiah 61 is the scripture that Jesus goes into when he goes into the temple one day and he's handed a scroll. And he reads part of the verse, amen, and he closes the scroll and he says, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And Brother Branham comes and and he he preaches... um, Oh, what does he preach? Amen. The next sermon he preaches is this day the scripture is fulfilled. Amen. But, he, but, he, but he's preaching on judgment. And I can't remember right, right now what he's preaching. It's not choosing of a bride, but it's something like that. Birth pains. Thank you. Birth pains. He's preaching the sixth seal. He's preaching judgment. He's preaching birth pains. Amen. And in birth pains, he begins to, he has this episode where his Bible, pages of Bible stick together. A priest comes and hands him his Bible. Amen. Just replicating the scene that Jesus had went through 2,000 years ago. Amen. And then Brother Branham, later the Lord tells him, amen, go, go back to your Bible. And then he sees the pages are stuck. And he, and, he, and he takes him to this realization that he just went through exactly what Jesus went through, but he didn't repeat what Jesus repeated. He was finishing what Jesus left off. Because he said part of this scripture applies to his first coming and part of the scripture applies to his second coming. So when when Brother Branham, when that priest hands him the scroll, amen, he reads out of that book, amen, he begins to to, to preach birth pains, he's actually actually noting, he's actually signifying that we're in the second coming now. This is the second coming. So Isaiah 61, verse 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. This is where Jesus stops. Now when Brother Branham comes back, 
Amen. Brother Branham doesn't come, he doesn't come in birth pains and read any of this verse. But he preaches the message birth pains, which is finishing what Jesus didn't finish. And later God shows him that that's what that's, this is what this is for. That Jesus had stopped here because the rest of it pertained to his second coming. So let's keep reading in verse two. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So the day of vengeance of our God, amen, is the wrath that is gonna be poured out, is the judgment that's coming upon the earth. But listen, listen, it also says to comfort all that mourn. Semicolon, not the end of the sentence yet. Let's finish the sentence. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All of this is to be fulfilled in the second coming, friends, and that's what's going on right now. Judgment to the world, amen. Judgment to the world, but comfort to all them that mourn, amen. You that have mourned the condition of the world, you have mourned the rejection of the word, you that mourn. Now in the second coming, there's coming a comfort for you that mourn. There's coming a, a, to a point unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. Amen, you've been rejected. The word has been rejected. Christ has been rejected. Amen, and put on the outside of the church. But in the second coming, you're getting beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees. <laughs> trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. His garden, his vineyard, his planting, his trees, trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Listen, the world is falling apart. The world is falling apart. That's what birth pains were about. But the birth pains that were bringing a destruction on the earth, the purpose of the birth pains was not to destroy the earth. The purpose of the birth pains is to bring a bright new world for a millennium. So it just depends on how you look at it, whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. When a woman goes into travail, this is what Brother Benham begins to preach. This is the scripture he's looking for. When a woman is in travail, amen. When a woman is in travail to bring forth a child, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It, it's, it's painful. It's difficult. It's near to death for her. It's a near death experience for her. Amen. But she's going through that to produce life. She's not going through that just for suffering. She's suffering for life. She's suffering to bring forth life. And the earth is going through birth pains, amen, to bring forth a bright new world for a millennium, amen, at the same time that, that catastrophe is striking and disasters on every hand and chaos on the earth, amen, there's oil of joy. There's, there's beauty for ashes. There's a garment of praise for the, this is not the time to hang our head and kick our feet in the dirt. Amen. He is here. Amen. The light is here. The lamb is here. The fruit is here. Amen. The carrot's not on the stick, but the fruit is in me. Amen. I've tasted of the Lord and I know that he is good. I've taken the book and eaten the book. This is the second coming for the believers. The second coming for the world is destruction. The second coming for the believers is joy, unspeakable and full of glory. That what? What's gonna happen in the second coming? That we might be trees of righteousness. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. These trees are trees of righteousness. And Brother Bam said there's gonna be a tree in every yard. See, all of these things are speaking of the same thing. Not five million trees of life, but one tree of life expressed in every member in the bride. Tree of life in your yard, in your yard, in your yard, in your yard, in my yard. Not a different tree of life. Not a secondary tree of life. Not a kind of tree of life or a knockoff tree of life, but the tree of life blooming in each believer. Brother Branham says in 1960, to whom would we go? If you got a little tree that's got apple trees, it'll bear apples if you just put it in the right foundation. 
If you've got a heart hungering for God, you want to see the power of God, you want to feel the vibrations of his eternal life, you want to see if the Holy Ghost is real or not, just plant your tree in his right foundation. And you'll find out something goes to work. Oh, he will begin to draw the waters of life and that little tree will begin to bear blossoms and fruit. It'll start growing because you're planted right. You've got to get started right, get, get, get the revival right. So if you want the tree to produce all that it can produce, it's got to be in the right foundation or the right soil. It's got to be planted on the right foundation, which is Christ the Word. Amen. The Word has been given back to us that the tree can be planted in the right ground. 1958, Brother Bram says, if a Christian church is divine <clears throat> or the branches that's in Christ, they'll do the works of Christ and bear the life of Christ. By their fruits, you shall know them. Now then, the way that he is today, he's here in the form of the Holy Spirit working through his church, performing the same things that he did there. That makes him the same yesterday, today, and forever. His life, the life that was in Christ, which was God, which was God, produced the kind of life that he lived then. That same life comes into his churches, his church members, since they have been purged by his blood and given the Holy Spirit access to work through them, bears the same fruit that he bore. Amen. So therefore, the world can see that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same tree, same fruit. In, in the second adoption message, Brother Bram preaches in 1960, he said, God, by his election, grace called you. God, by his election, grace sanctified you. God, by his election, grace and his power baptized you and put you into his land of rest. They which have entered into this rest have ceased from their going astray. They ceased from their works like God did from his. They have joy unspeakable and full of glory. The tree of life is blooming in them. Where is this tree of life? It's blooming in you, in your yard. Amen, the tree of life. Amen. Brother Branham, oh, I mean, I mean, don't dismiss anything the prophet of God says. He makes a statement like that, the tree of life will be blooming in every yard. What scripture is that? What are you talking about? Oh my goodness, just take a prophet for a prophet. He's trying to get you to see something. He's not saying there's going to be a literal, I don't know, maybe there is a literal tree of life in every yard. I don't know. But what he's trying to show us is the condition that should be present today. Amen. The tree of life should be blooming in our hearts, friends. It should be bringing forth the same fruit that it produced in the first church, the same fruit that it produced in Jesus Christ. It should be producing now. Amen. Don't limit that life in any way. Amen. If he, if he opened blinded eyes, he can open blinded eyes today. He can do it spiritually and he can do it physically. Amen. If he raised the dead, he can raise the dead today. He can raise the spiritually dead and he can raise the physically dead. Amen. Don't limit that fruit in any way and don't put it on a carrot at the end of a stick and say it's for tomorrow or another day or another time. It's for now. The full life is available now. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. Amen. Through his vessels. It's not for us to manufacture, it's not for us to work up, but do not limit the power of God. Do not limit the life that is here. It should be bearing, amen. This tree that's blooming in our heart, it should be bearing all manner of fruit in every season. That means when sickness strikes your house, amen, it should bear fruit of healing. Amen, when need strikes your house, it should, amen, it should bear fruit of provision. Amen. If, if evil spirits bring torment unto your house, it should bring a fruit of deliverance. Amen. This tree that's blooming in our heart, it should bring forth fruit in every season and not be barren. A, a fruit for every occasion. A, a fruit for every need. Amen. Why? Because the tree of life is blooming in my heart, bringing forth fruit, bringing forth worship, bringing forth obedience. Amen. In every situation. If sickness comes, there's a fruit of healing. If need comes, there's a fruit of provision. Amen. How many of you are experiencing that and say, that's the truth, amen. amen. When it comes at my door, I find there's something in me that I didn't know was there before, and all of a sudden, God does something, and there's fruit, amen. Fruit of the word comes on display in the hour of need. Amen. Why? Because there's a fruit tree blooming in our hearts. A tree of life is blooming in them. They have long suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience, faith, meekness, gentleness, and so forth. The tree of life is blooming in them because their hope is anchored in Christ Jesus, the witness of the Holy Ghost bearing record with signs and wonders following the believers. 
Let's turn to 1 Corinthians together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, verse six. It says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. I mentioned that a few weeks ago, but they're not laborers for God. They're working in partnership with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You're his field, you're his garden, you're his vineyard. All the labor that was going on was for God's husbandry. You're God's husbandry, you're his building, you're the thing he's trying, you're the garden he's bringing back. You're the tree he's restoring. You're his project. He's the great husbandman, which means farmer or keeper of vines. Amen. And, and all the ministry that Paul was talking about, we're labors together with God, but you're the project we're all working on. You're the project God's working on. You're the project Paul was working on. You're the project Apollos is working on. One's planting, one's watering, one's pruning. What are we doing? What are we working for? We're working for the bride tree. We're working for the restoration of the bride tree. Let's go to John 15. God uses this analogy over and over and over again. That we're the planting of the Lord, we're the vineyard of the Lord, we're the vine of, of, of Christ, and we're the branches, he's the vine. Just over and over we see the same thing reflecting back. John 15, one. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. See, like I said, there's a process. And in this process, Apollos, Paul, pastor, evangelist, friend, another brother, they're laborers together with God in God's husbandry in his field. But part of what God does is right here. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. But it was bearing fruit. Why did he purge it? Why did he cut it? Why? It was bearing fruit. Because when he began to see fruit, he recognized that that's a true vine. When it begins to give fruit of the word, amen. How many of you can testify of this with me? Amen, when you gave your heart to the Lord and God miraculously transformed your life, all of a sudden it was fruit, 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 answered prayers, healings, all kinds of manifestations. And then all of a sudden purging. And nothing you prayed for happened. Before every prayer you prayed was answered, then all of a sudden you go through a time. What's he doing? He, he, that, that's a vine. That's an original fine from the original rootstock, amen. It's bringing forth fruit, amen. That's where, amen, we all gotta get together and work with God, amen, and work in this vineyard. This is one from the original stock, friends. This is one that's tied back to the original, amen. This is where the pruning comes. He didn't prune it, amen, to stop it from bearing fruit. He said, he that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it might bring forth more fruit. Because this, this bride tree is going to bear every month. Not just one time, not a flash in a pan, but when God's done, when the great husbandman is done with his work, he's going to prune off every little sucker. Everything that, that's not producing life, everything that's extra, everything that's unnecessary, he's going he's to strip it away, he's going to prune it away, amen, so that it can bring forth more fruit. There's going to be fruit every month, amen. There's going to be all manner of fruit in its season. So he says, Jesus goes on to say, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so that ye be my disciples. How is the Lord glorified? When you bear much fruit, it glorifies God. Not you, it glorifies the husbandmen who kept this vine. That's why in Isaiah 61, 3, you are, the, you are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This tree bringing forth fruit in its season is to glorify God because it was his plan from the beginning. See, like I said, God uses this analogy over and over and over again. He even uses this analogy in the Old Testament, amen, speaking of the nation of Israel. He said, consider my vineyard. What more could I have done? Amen, I, I, I built a hedge of protection around them. Amen, I digged and I dung the soil. I, I did everything, but yet it still wouldn't give me fruit. See, God's very clear in his description in the Bible he doesn't want a vine that says, I'm a vine. He wants the manifestation of the life from the root to come out of this branch. He doesn't want to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I believe the message. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for something that'll bring the life of the message, the fruit of the message. Amen, what, what God was talking about all through his Bible. He doesn't want, amen, he doesn't want a nice stone hedge all the way around and a bunch of unbarren vines, amen. He wants something that's bringing forth fruit. He said, I, that this was a good garden. Israel was a good garden, amen. It had stone wall all the way around it. it had, he had dung the soil, he had digged the soil, he had pruned the vine, and when he goes back to it, there's no fruit. That's why Jesus curses the fig tree, because there's no fruit. God doesn't want us to know about these things, he wants us to live them. God doesn't want us to say, someday, oh, this, this bride tree, the someday she's gonna produce fruit. <laughs> What more does he have to do, friends? He's put the wall up. He's trimmed the vines. He's dung the soil. He's digged it. Amen. What's he looking for? For fruit. Yield back to him fruit. Brother Bram says, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He says, now there's only one thing can happen. There has to be a message at the end time when there's nothing else can follow it. And now the ecumenical world has set up of such a regime, there could be no denomination and no nothing else follow it. You're either in it or you're not in it. The fruit is in the top of the tree and the light is shining on that predestinated fruit. And she is ripening into Christ-like fruit, bringing forth the same mellowness and sweetness and the same spirit that he had in him. I hope you see it. See, when Brother Ram goes into Christ's mystery God revealed, for me, it, this clarifies some things for me because it's not just being able to replicate certain kind of works, but it's to have the same spirit. You can replicate some of the works. Like you can replicate, there, there can be a replication of healing. Brother Bram said, you know, the witch doctors can accomplish some of that. A replication of tongues and interpretations in a witch doctor. You can have, I mean, all kinds of denominations can have different replications of certain works. Amen. And if we, if we, have, to take, if we have to take every work as a sign that that's where Christ is, then every time there's a healing, you have to say Christ is in that church. Which there's always healing. That's one of the fruits. It should always be there. Divine healing should always be part of us, amen? Tongues should always be part of us. Every gift that was ever given was never taken away. But what he's showing here is it's not just a certain gift that's replicated or a certain demonstration, but it's the very nature in life that was in that original tree, amen, is what's shining forth in this bride tree. It can't have a different nature. It can't have a different sweetness and mellowness than Christ himself. I don't care. I, don't, I shouldn't say I don't care. But you can get look-alike fruit and not have the same life in the root. 
but we want all the fruit that's supposed to be on this tree that's coming from the original life, the original nature. It's got to be the same mellowness and sweetness and the same spirit that he had in him. Brother Brennan says in Jehovah Jireh from 1964, he said, look, old brother, when the Holy Spirit come into that vine and produce from its vine to the first branch and they wrote a book of Acts behind it, if that tree ever puts forth another original limb, she'll grow the same thing. It'll be Jesus Christ. What did he say? Did you catch that? He said, if this, if this original book of Acts, he said, when the, the vine put, when that first vine put forth a branch, they wrote a book of Acts about it. If they ever do the same thing, it'll be the same thing. It'll be Jesus Christ. Not doing some of the things he did, it'll be him with his full nature and his full life. Now we've got Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, everything else grafted into it, bearing denominational fruit. But if it ever puts forth another branch, she'll be a genuine Christ-filled, Christ-centered word of God. It didn't say she'd believe the word of God, it said she would be the word of God. She'll be a genuine Christ-filled, Christ-centered word of God. The word of God made alive. Let's look to Romans. I want to read this as our last scripture. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. It says, right, yeah, Romans 7 and 1. Know you not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. How are we going to bring forth fruit? We have to get married. We have to be divorced from the old life, from the old man, from the old nature. It has to die, amen. But then we have to be married to Christ so that we can bring forth fruit unto God. This bride tree has to bring forth fruit. Brother Brown says in the restoration of the bride tree, but what? He was God's perfect prophet tree, the example tree, the bridegroom tree, amen, glory. Going to say something directly. He is the bridegroom tree, do you believe it? From the Garden of Eden, amen. Then the bridegroom tree without the female don't bear fruit. So he's got to have a bride tree. She has got to be born of the same material, the word made flesh in the tree. Hope you get it. It's the same life in this female tree, the bridegroom, as it is in the bride. The works that I do shall you also. Why? Because it's the same life. So if the bridegroom tree can't produce fruit without the bride tree, can the bride tree produce fruit without the bridegroom tree? See, what's the key to producing fruit? One, you have to be the right seed. You have to be planted in the right foundation, which is the word. The right seed in the right foundation. Then, it's got to be watered from the word. It's got to receive the light of the sun. Amen. All of these things that was typed out through the message and in the Bible. And it grows up and it's got to be purged and pruned by the husbandman. But still, it's got to come in contact with the male to bring forth life. The bridegroom tree needs the bride tree. The bride tree needs the bridegroom tree. When you say, I'm, I'm bride, I'm bride, I'm bride, that's wonderful, amen, but you've got to be one with the bridegroom so that the life of the bridegroom, amen, can come through the bride tree. Because the tree of life has to be blooming in every yard, bringing forth all manner of fruit. 
This is the, the wedding. The wedding has produced pollination. Pollination produces fruit. This is the season, friends. I want to finish with this last quote. Brother Mem says in Investments, 1963, he says, I was remarking about in my soul a few moments ago, in mind about bearing the fruit of the Spirit as one of the brothers give that quotation, bearing fruit. You know, we can't manufacture fruit. We have to bear fruit. Sheep doesn't manufacture wool, but because he, but because he has wool and bears wool, he is a sheep. These are simple ideas, simple concepts. But they're as true as true can be all the way through. He bears wool, he is a sheep. That's the reason he bears wool. That's the only way we can ever be a Christian is not because that we have the name or try to work up something to manufacture it. Being a sheep, you just bear wool. Being a Christian, you just bear the fruits of it. See, we can't work this up. We can't pump it up. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it happen. But on the flip side, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to bring balance to that. We can hinder it. So you, you can't make yourself seed when you're not seed. But even if you are the right seed, you can hinder this process. You can hinder this process by staying away from the husbandman. You can hinder this process by not drinking in the water. You can hinder this process by not standing still and being pruned. See, we can hinder this process, but we can never manufacture fruit. So there's this, there's this Calvinistic Armenian thing again. We're back, I mean, to the book of Ephesians again. Back to the, the fact that if you're not of the original stock of the original tree of life, you cannot produce the 12 manner of fruits. But even if you are of that original stock and then that original, and you've got the capability of producing fruit in every season, under every occasion, for every need, it's all there. The potential's in the seed. Amen, you've got it all. But you've got to be able to stand the purging. You've got to be drinking in the water. You've got to be basking in the light. Amen, we've got to be surrendering and submissing in pure worship to God. And if we can just surrender to him and let him cut where we need cut, if we just let him bring the water and the rain and drink it in when he gives it to us, if we'll just lay in the presence of the sun, we will produce 12 manner of fruit, fruit for every occasion, fruit for every season, fruit to meet every need that comes our way. And if we look at our lives and we reflect and we say, sometimes I'm satisfied with what I see. I see God working in my life, but over here, I'm not so satisfied. 10 months of the year, fruit. Two months, the tree's not bearing. Doing good at work, doing good at church, not so good at home, right? Good at home, good at work, not so good with my brothers and sisters, church. This is reality. This is the reality. I'm not saying that's not a tree of life. I'm not saying the tree of life is not blooming, blooming in your yard. But that tree of life is intended to constantly bring forth fruit for every occasion in every season. Sometimes we just need to look and say, God, I realize you need to purge me. I realize that I'm dry and I need a little bit of rain. God, help me not to run from the light, but help me to lean into the light. Help me not to stay away from fellowship. Help me not to remove myself from the purging hand of the husbandman. Help me just to surrender, Lord. Amen. I'm not happy with partial, because this isn't the age of partial. I'm not just happy that I believe the message and got a sanctified life and got a revelation of the seals and, and I've got a nice family. But I want to bear all manner of fruit in every season. I want to have no barrenness in my life in any place. I want every branch, every vine in this tree to bloom and bring forth fruit. And I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. But God's promised that he'll send the rain. And that there's a team of workers laboring with God 
and God's husbandry. And just yield to that hand. God knows what's in us, and he knows to get it out, how to get it out. If you see a tree, if you'd go by and you look at apple trees right now, apple trees are bearing like crazy. They're starting to harvest. They'll be harvesting now, uh, I don't know how long, but the leafy green, bunch of apples hanging all over it. But you know the husbandman of that field, after he gathers up those apples, if he wants to get the same thing next year, what is he gonna have to do to that tree? Here in a month or two, he's gonna have to cut it down. And it's gonna look like he tried to kill the tree. And you're gonna say, what did you do to your tree? He said, I'm ensuring that it'll bring forth in its season again. See, there's times that God, because, because he intends for the tree of life to be blooming, there's times he's got to cut. Time to water, time to fertilize, time for everything. But he's gonna make sure that we bear 12 manner of fruit. And I say, be it unto me, God. I'm your tree. I believe with all my heart I'm part of that tree. I believe it. I believe that I'm part of that city. That, that if he talks about a dwelling place there, it's me. He's talking about me. If he says there'll be, if the, if the, if the, if the, if he says the tree of life will be blooming in every yard, that's describing me. That's my yard. I believe it. But I also know I need the great husbandman to keep doing the work so that I can bring forth fruit in every season. I want to bear all manner of fruit. I want to be whatever Jesus Christ was on earth, I want him to have that potential in me. And whenever he calls for it, I want it to come out. And if he uses opposition to bring it out, so be it. If he uses difficulty and hardship to bring out that fruit, so be it. My goal is to bear fruit in every season, not to dictate which season. I've got to bear fruit in July. I've got to bear fruit in June because he's gonna have all manner of fruit. There's going to be a tree of life blooming in every yard. Let's all stand. Do you believe you're part of that tree of life? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Just in your own heart, how many of you would like to say, Lord, I think I need some pruning? but I welcome it, Lord. Or we could maybe say, Lord, I see that what's going on in my life is you've been pruning me. You're not mad at me. It's not just a bad set of circumstances. It's not just a lot in life I have, but it's actually, Lord, your hand pruning me. And you may not have recognized it, brother or sister. You may not have recognized it till tonight, but it wasn't just a bad set of circumstances. It wasn't just something you're going through but there's a hand that's holding the pruning shears. And he knows how much to cut off and how much to leave on. And he knows how to get the fruit out of this tree. He knows when we need rain. He knows when we need purge. He knows what, how much sun we need. And we just, if we could just reflect and say, Lord, I recognize it's been you all along. It's not been me with a, a bad life and, bad set of circumstances. And if, I, if I would only made other decisions, things would have worked out different. No, Lord, you're trying to mold me into your image. How many of you would like to just say, God, I recognize that this has all been you because you wanted a, a planting, a planting, tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that you might be glorified. Let's just pray to him, Lord Jesus, God, what your prophet said is for today. That the tree of life should be blooming in our hearts. That in the second coming, when the world is being purged and judgment is striking the earth, Lord, you've, you've poured out oil of joy, a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You've given us beauty for ashes that we might be the planting of the Lord, trees of righteousness, your planting for your glory to bring forth fruit in this season. 
God, have your way with us. Let the tree of life be blooming in our yard, Lord. Let all who pass by see fruits of Jesus Christ in every season. Let there be no more barrenness in your bride, Lord. No more strife, no more vainglory, no more bitterness, no more backbiting, no more laziness, Lord. Let there be no more barrenness in your bride, but your whole bride, your whole bride tree will bring forth all manner of fruit in every season, Lord. And in every circumstance, I pray, God, that you would purge out everything that's not like you, everything that's hindering, Lord, every disease and every affliction and every bug that would try to hinder this life. I pray that you would take care of it now in the name of Jesus Christ, that we might be free to express what's on the inside of us, that we might be free to bring forth the fruit that you're calling for in this day. And you're drawing us by your light. You're drawing us by the water. You're drawing us up to bring forth this fruit. Let it be the same sweetness and mellowness with the same power that was in Jesus Christ. Open blinded eyes, spiritually and natural. Raise the dead, both spiritually and natural. Do all the work that you intended to do. You left a portion for this hour. You didn't complete all your work in your earthly journey, but you left a portion to do in and through your bride. Lord, let it be done in me. Purge me, Lord. Groom me, O oh God. Tie me up, water me, pour your light upon me, Lord, that I might be all that you would want me to be in this life. Let the tree of life be blooming in my yard, God. Let the reflection of that heavenly Jerusalem be reflected now in your body upon this earth. Everything that's there, let it be expressed here. All of the life, all of the glory, all of the light, all of the water from the water of life, let it be expressed on this earth through your bride. Let your city here reflect that city there. And let the light go to all the ends of the earth, that all the earth will be lighted with your light. Oh God, we praise your name and thank you for what you're doing in this hour. We just thank you, God, that you've called us to be a part of it. We recognize our insufficiency. We can't manufacture these things. We can't make them happen. You've already predestinated it. But, oh God, we now yield to your hand and we yield to your ways to let you have your way and produce your fruit. Bless each one, Lord, as we, we go back to work tomorrow and to life and to all the things. God, there's seasons in our life. There's obstacles, but there's a potential for fruit in us to bear fruit in the face of each one. Let it come forth now in Jesus Christ's name. Oh, we love you. Have your way in us. Use us for your glory. Take us from, it, from here and every day that we're alive on this earth, shine your light through us. We give you ourselves in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Bless you. In my life. come with the pruning shears, don't run away. He's not here to hurt you. That water now is flowing down from the throne and it's going through every terrace and every little canal 
It's here to water us, friends. Let's drink from it. Let's drink like we're thirsty. Let's drink this word. Let's drink this life in. Let's sit in the sun and enjoy all that's given to us today. Let's take advantage of what the gardener has given us. The water of life, the light of life, everything we have need of to produce everything that's available. Let's enjoy it and thank God for it. I'm so thankful that I can't manufacture anything. If I had to manufacture it, oh, you know how tired we'd be? We'd be exhausted. We don't have to manufacture it. But how does, Brother Bam said, how does a sheep, amen, bear wool? He said, it just bears wool. The shepherd is there to make sure the sheep gets the right environment, protection from predators, the right kind of water, the right kind of food so that it can produce all the potential it's had. The great shepherd is here to lead us in the green pastures besides still waters, to get the water, to get the food, to get the protection that we need so that we can do what? Bear wool. The husbandman is here to make sure that the vineyard has everything it needs to do what? To bear fruit. He's come. He's given us everything we need. We need to rest and say, God, have your work. Do what you're going to do. But I'm yielding completely, entirely to you, oh God. Let's sing this song again. Yeah. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord. Singing, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name.